Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 State of the Union. I am Double H, and I'm here with Gloom, our WFTDA Vice President. This is the keynote for our WFTDA online annual meeting that is happening this weekend, but it's also an opportunity for us to talk to the roller derby community uh, so we can tell you all about the plans as we know them moving forward for the next several months and into 2022. So the first thing before we begin, I would really like to say thank you. Thank you to our WFTDA members. Um, you put li lives before laces. Uh, you did a lot of hard work this year, even though you weren't able to skate, many of you. Um, and so the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, I think, really uh, put a lot of strain on the sport, but you rose to the challenge. Uh, you helped us put lives before laces. And we have not had any direct reports of COVID-19 as a result of playing WFTDA roller derby this year. That is an amazing accomplishment we could not have done this without you. And so the very first thing that we really wanted to say today was thank you. The next thing that we wanted to say is now that we've put all this time and energy into saving lives, it is time for us to save our sport. We recognize that as a governing body, the WFTDA also needs to do, to do the work to get our members back on track as safely as we possibly can. We sacrificed the sport we loved. A lot of us were not able to play roller derby in the past year. This was a very difficult choice. We sacrificed a lot and I believe it was the right decision, but we are really excited to talk to you today about our plans for recovery because we know you are eager to hear those words. So we are in the process of building out an intensive recovery plan. Um, and we have in this presentation information about competition and recognized, uh, sorry, regionalized recovery, updates on our COVID-19 guidelines, uh, some introductory comments about our COVID-19 recovery fund. And even though it is last, it is last because it is the thing we want you to remember. We have information about anti-racism and updates from our art project, which is incredibly important and meaningful to all of this work. And we couldn't do any of this work if we didn't put it into that context. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to pass the mic over to Gloom uh, as we are going to take a few moments to hold space. Hi, um, so I'm Gloom, I'm Vice President of the WFTDA. Um, and I just wanna take some time today um, to hold some space for and acknowledge um, how much, how many, um, traumas in the fields of social, racial, gender justice, et cetera, uh, that are affecting WFTDA members worldwide right now. Um, we have a rich tapestry of experiences uh, that makes up the WFTDA, and we know how frayed some of the threads in that tapestry have become. Um, as for starters, the ongoing uh, murders of black and brown Americans at the hands of law enforcement, uh, state violence in Argentina and worldwide, uh, attacks on women in Mexico City, um, the global rights of trans athletes in sports, including rugby um, and US-based discrimination against trans women, non-binary people affected by trans misogyny, trans use at the state level, attacks against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders across the US, uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, uh, continued oppression of indigenous humans globally, um, among many, many more. There's no way this could ever be an exhaustive list, and it only reflects a small portion of the intersectionality we navigate. Um, our sport does not exist in a vacuum. And we want to hold space for our community members, our family, 
um, who are fighting against and trying to heal from these traumas in the 33 countries in which we play roller derby. That in mind, hand it back to the lich. Beyond these traumas, thank you, Gloom, uh, for naming many of them and for offering us a chance to hold space. Uh, we're collectively working to heal and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. We'd like to take a moment of silence to help us hold that space. And I should also acknowledge that I am coming to you from Philadelphia today, which is Lenape land. Um, so we sit upon all of these layers of trauma beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wanted to take a moment of silence to help us hold that space and to recognize the friends, community members, family members, and loved ones that we've lost this year, whether to COVID-19, to violence, or to other traumas. So I'm going to offer a moment of silence now. Thank you for sharing that moment of silence and thank you for being on this roller derby journey with us. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, a, really addressing the fact that the WFTDA is a US based entity, but we are a global organization. And so a lot of our conversations have to contemplate a, a multitude of different perspectives. Um, we need to acknowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic is not over, even though we wish it were over today and we could play roller derby everywhere today. That is not necessarily true. It's not possible. So we're really trying to put together the best plans we can uh, for the 33 countries that we represent. And uh, I'd like to, to address that our next steps for competitive play really go hand in hand with our COVID-19 recovery process. So I want to also acknowledge that as we discuss changes that are coming, we need to leave space and time and thought for the fact that our recovery process will still be happening throughout all of this trauma. And we need to leave space for that. We need to honor that. Um, and even as we begin to get back uh, into roller derby and get roller derby back into our lives, if that is what we're looking to do, we'll be processing this year for a long time. And so our entire approach to this is to be thoughtful and honor um, these challenges. We want to put community before competition. So we're making a very intentional choice to do that. So let's talk about competitive play and recovery. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to share might seem like it is potentially obvious, but it's important to let everybody know that we are not anticipating competition in 2021 at a tournament level. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests about sanctioning from areas of, of the world that are able to do that, um, but we are not going to be providing sanctioning or rankings for the remainder of 2021. So we will keep those closed, uh, but we, what we are planning to do is set up a game registration system so that we can continue to collect data on that. I think it's really important to understand where games are being played and to keep track of them and to try to keep as good data as possible. Uh, you may also hear from my puppy during this presentation, so I apologize in advance if you hear barking in the background. Um, and then uh, we're going to take the time to review officiating certification uh, to also really assess for equity, sustainability, um, and accessibility. So again, no cups, playoffs, or championships, no sanctioning or rankings, focusing on development of regional system. Now that's a really important thing that we're going to start to work on internally in the WFTDA and with the art project as we move forward into phase two. 
So what does that actually mean? <laughs> uh, community over competition or community before competition. Um, the remainder of 2021 and into 2022, that's the key phrase that we're really looking to keep. Uh, we'll be spending the next few months building out a competitive plan that is a placeholder season for 2022. Um, one of our top concerns is that Roller Derby, even in 2022, may not be fully recovered everywhere in the world. So we have to think pretty critically about how to help leagues who are able to play, play, and how to help leagues who are not able to play make that transition into gameplay when they're able to do so. So we have a de-emphasis on sanctioning and travel team rankings. We want our members to focus on rebuilding your leagues at the ground level. And we want to emphasize safety in rebuilding this and also equity um, and anti-racism. That's an incredibly important part of the process. So again, what does that really mean? Well, what we know now is that we are interested in focusing on a regional recovery process. So 2022 will likely focus on regional recovery and gameplay, the continued registration of games. Uh, and we've been working very closely, even through the pandemic, with recognized tournaments and events. And even though they haven't necessarily been able to uh, occur, we're still working with folks around the world to figure out if they can have events, when those might be able to happen. Um, We've also talked about how recognized tournaments and events don't need to be focused around rankings. I know a lot of conversations had happened at the recognized tournament level in terms of being a place where leagues would go or teams would go to get additional sanctioned games to count for their rankings. We're really looking at these events as community building opportunities. We want um, folks to, rega to regain skill. We want officials and announcers. We want announcers who haven't talked for a year <laughs> to be able to remember how to talk again on a microphone. Um, so again, everything that we are thinking about doing, we want to put together with the intentionality of it of being able to do what each region is capable of doing at the pace that they can do it. Uh, and that's a very complicated process, which is why a lot of these conversations have been so, so long. Um, and I think they will continue to progress into 2022. Um, and this is this is part of our timeline process, right? The, so thinking about into 2022, we want to, in quarters three and four, we've talked to the art project about how we're interested in working to prioritize some thoughts around 2022 competition. What are some interim solutions that we could put into place in 2022? The art project has prioritized competition as part of their interest in uh, rebuilding an equitable pathway for our members. So that's gonna take some time to build. Um, the We are also looking to collect WFTDA member information about uh, how that could possibly look and how it could work. So we absolutely need folks to be back into our community to talk to us about these things. We have been working with national governing bodies and we will continue to do that as well as regional stakeholders because it's important to understand that not every region has a national governing body, the US included. And so we might need to think of uh, how regions could be represented differently in these conversations. Then um, we want to continue working with recognized tournaments to plan community events. And we're really thinking of having our 2022 competitive framework by the end of this year. Uh, we don't want to wait too long because everyone wants to be able to plan for 2022, but we're definitely going to need some time to put something thoughtful um, and as equitable as possible together. So one of the biggest impacts on our timelines uh, and our competitive conversation has always been COVID-19. 
And I think, uh, again, I really want to emphasize, I, I definitely hear the frustrations that many of you have voiced around, uh, you know, our, our lack of speed around some of the changing conditions. But please understand that we have 33 countries that we're trying to sift through. Some of them have national governing bodies, some of them do not. So the challenges are many when we're trying to make plans that can be flexible and adaptable to include everyone. So that is at the focal point of our conversations. Now, the WFTDA's return to play guidelines were updated in March 2021. And if you attended the incubator session at the beginning of May, um, you had the opportunity to maybe talk through some questions. Uh, we have been getting a lot of great questions at the COVID-19 inbox, which is COVID-19 at WFTDA, um, asking a lot of math questions, which is great. Uh, we are continuing to use the return to play guidelines and our ideal is that we will continue to shift them over time as conditions start to change. So we recognize that many regions have been and are loosening and lifting restrictions pretty significantly. Um, and in particular in the United States, this is due to mass vaccination programs or in places like Australia and New Zealand, this is due to exceptional control of the spread of COVID-19 that those governments have done. So we want to emphasize that, yes, we are still using the return to play guidelines uh, and we will continue to update them as we get new information and we process that new information. You can expect the next update to happen in June. One of the most exciting conversations that we are thrilled to bring to you today is that we will be introducing some new updates in June 2021 and we are going to try to get them released as quickly as we can in early June. Um, the challenges include that there are lower COVID cases in some areas but persistently higher case rates in other areas that roller derby is being played. Um, Similarly, we have consideration for mass vaccination programs, but those vaccination programs are rolled out totally differently in different countries. Um, whereas the United States is focused on trying to vaccinate as many people fully as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, locations like Canada uh, are prioritizing that first shot of a two-shot program and then going on to give the second shot. Um, and we'll probably end up with a higher vaccination rate overall than the United States, which is really cool. But that's one of the things that has made this so challenging for us to sift through. Uh, so that is why we want to make sure that our guidelines have been, uh, our updates have been thought about as comprehensively as possible. But I can give you some spoilers. Um, some of the highlights of our new pre-baseline level. We are gonna be introducing a new pre-baseline level. Uh, and there are a couple reasons for this and I'll talk about them in a second. But our, we are looking to institute essentially a four week minimum. Um, we want to prioritize outdoor only practice and we understand that that could pose challenges for certain leagues. So we're looking to make that uh, as well thought out as possible. Maybe there are pavilion type uh, venues or uh, differently ventilated venues that would qualify. Um, but ideally we wanted a place that was as aerated as possible. Um, Non-contact drills is really, really the focal point of this pre-baseline level, including footwork, line, line drills, endurance, um, and then pods of smaller groups and small group programming. Now, this is extremely intentional because even in the short window of time that we have had WFTDA roller derby being played in the United States, we have had some leagues stepping on the ladder over the last year. And in particular, over these past several months, we've had several injuries because people are so excited to play roller derby again that they are doing things their body bodies are not ready to do. So we are absolutely prioritizing, we're building an artificial 
minimum of time, minimum of type of work that we would like to recommend to our leagues who qualify for pre-baseline update level. Um, we can also talk about um, what the criteria is going to look like for that. I, we are still working on some of those criteria, but what I can share is that they are less strict or looser and a good number of leagues in the United States could qualify in June to get back on skates for pre-baseline level. And that is our goal. Our goal is to try to figure out how we can safely get you back on skates. We also wanna take this time um, to talk about ableism and vaccines. And we've gotten a lot of feedback uh, throughout this entire uh, process about how, um, well, we're all vaccinated, we should just be able to play. Um, we want to remind you that many community members may not be able to get a vaccine due to medical conditions. And so our plan is focused on a strong recommendation of vaccination. Um, if your league wants to do vaccination drives, if you want to work with local uh, medical staff to talk about how your league can volunteer to help get people vaccinated, those are all extremely important and critical measures to control the spread of this pandemic that we want you involved in. But vaccination does not mean that teams and skaters are automatically able to play roller derby. The guidelines are still in effect for that reason. Um, but really what we're looking to do is make COVID rates overall low enough so that someone with medical conditions that would not be able to qualify for vaccination could be conceivably safe enough to play or be part of your roller derby community again. And the, the final note I think is probably the most important, which is that we're asking you to take a slow intentional approach to returning because we still have so much equity work to do. Uh, and this is across a number of levels. I was actually browsing the internet the other day and noticed that several, several leagues have mentioned in the past still using the minimum skills requirements. Those are not in effect anymore. We have, this is Roller Derby, which uh, our members can go and um, download and read. And we have the entire incubator session that we did at the beginning of May that talks about how to use it. But equity and removing barriers to entry have to be part of your plan. Equity has to be part of your plan. Um, anti-racism, removing transphobia, all of these things have to be part of your plan. And it can't just be flipping a switch back on to something that was. We have to think about how to intentionally create safer spaces that haven't existed yet. So it's important for us to create intentionality around that process. One thing that I wanted to uh, shift to talking about is acknowledging that leagues have struggled financially during this pandemic. Um, and I think we in the WFTEA feel that pretty strongly. We've had, uh, if you are a member, you can go and watch the finance presentation in the online annual meeting. And we have had a lot of financial challenges this year as well that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but what we recognized is that if we work together collectively, um, I think we have the best possible chance of succeeding in a financial recovery sense as well. So in 2021, the WFTDA has been working hard to shift our revenue model to a more development and fundraising focused um, setup because we are a 501c3, which is a nonprofit in the United States. And we want to be able to help take advantage of those funds to assist our members in recovering from COVID-19. Because we know that the impacts have been catastrophic. 
So over the last year and a half, we've talked to uh, you, our members, and in the times that we have uh, surveyed you, we conducted two member surveys in 2020 and then one recently in April 2021, and we estimate roughly 90% of our members, our leagues, have lost members from their leagues as well. Overall, between not having tournaments in 2020 and not having tournaments in 2021, uh, recognized tournaments not being able to have tournaments, all of your leagues not being able to have events, we estimate collectively that this is in excess of six million US dollars over the course of a year and a half. So this is a pretty challenging uh, financial situation for any sport to be in, but for an amateur sport, it is particularly vulnerable. So one of the things that we're looking to do is put together a COVID recovery fund. Uh, so to help rebuild our community, we want to launch this fund in June. Um, and we want to ask folks who are particularly the folks who have been outside of our community to help get involved in the recovery of our sport. Um, our WFTDA COVID-19 guidelines have gotten some amazing press and amazing PR. We have had over 1,200 downloads of our plans from places like Harvard University, NYU School of Health, Yale Repertory Theater. All of these organizations who are not roller derby have seen and have used our guidelines. Um, I had an amazing conversation the other day with a colleague in another women's sport who said the same thing. She said, I loved your guidelines. When we, were have, when we were trying to decide what to do with our sport, we looked at them. So we know that the work that we do in the WFTDA has meaning and value outside of our community. And those are the networks and conversations that we wanna be having to bring funds in for our COVID recovery fund. And our goal is to uh, work to collect funds for this program in June. And roughly the end of July is when we would open applications. So this plan would essentially be a micro grant program for WFTDA community members and businesses in order to help recover from COVID-19 impacts. So we're looking to help cover um, obtaining venue or practice space or paying utilities or service agreements. And a lot of this will have to do with the amount of money that we're able to uh, fundraise for and bring in. But the goal is to really try to make a meaningful amount for as many leagues as possible. Um, so we do have a couple program priorities that we've outlined already. And again, we are also still trying to uh, tweak this as we go, but we are essentially prioritizing uh, WFTDA members in good standing um, who prioritize anti-racism and equity programming and policy. Um, we will prioritize organizations that have a majority by POC leadership and or oversight or are actively working to increase representation in their leadership. Um, and we're still talking about ways that we can collect that information so that we can see that that is true. Um, but these are the basics that we're really trying to finalize and put together so that we can make a meaningful and equitable and fair process for grant making. Again, we're looking to open the fund in June um, for collecting donations. Um, so you will see us fundraising in the community, um, not from the community. We understand that WFTDA members are hopeful to be able to, or looking forward to be able to apply for these micro grants at the end of July. So really we're trying to make this an outward facing conversation as best we can, and we would love your help in sharing the message. Uh, but ideally we're trying to make it so that we can have a monthly review of applications with a rolling deadline through November. So the final piece of our conversation today, uh, we, we can't talk about the recovery of our sport with, without viewing this from an anti-racism lens. Um, so all of the decisions that you've heard us make 
all of the conversations that we've had today, all of them are coming to coming from a place of acknowledging that we must be using an anti-racist lens to do this work. We must be using an equity lens to do this work. And that takes time in reworking adequately. So we're excited to be able to talk to you more specifically about some of the work that the uh, art project has been doing over the past uh, eight or so months. Before we do, though, I wanted to share this exciting uh, message. We are going to, as part of our COVID relief fund, uh, we are going to be putting out our very first annual report. We've never, we're a 501c3 and we've never had an annual report before, but we've put together uh, uh, Catherine, our Catherine Beater Bones, uh, Bonesy, our um, director of education and development has put together an amazing impact report that we're super excited to share with the world. And one of the um, one of the moments in this document, I think, is really valuable is a message from Deadeye, our president on the WFTDA board. Um, who says, with our sport on hold, 2020 was a powerful call to action, pushing us to recede our foundational values as a community first and foremost. We cannot rebuild the structures that marginalized members of our sport. As roller derby returns in 2021, WFTDA is committed to creating new, equitable, and sustainable competitive pathways and deeper member engagement in building a community welcoming to everyone. Looking forward, we need to continue dismantling old and new barriers for our sport and others as lawmakers continue pushing anti-trans and other discriminatory legislation. Roller Derby can and should take the lead in discussing the rights of transgender women in sport, pushing back on media outlets or policymakers who marginalize or other. And I think that that is just such um, an incredibly powerful way to describe the place where WFTDA leadership is right now. This change is meant to be widespread. It is meant to be long lasting and it is going to take time and engagement. We are so honored and excited to have the participation of our anti-racism team to help us with this, the art project. Uh, so we, we started with 12 panel members from nine different countries and five continents. Um, we really dug pretty deeply in terms of thinking about how we could best um, bring in expertise. And I think the, the folks on the art project panel have really spoken truth to power in a moment where we needed to hear it. And so we're incredibly grateful to them uh, for giving us their time because they work to help us center by POC community members for this change process. Um, change takes time, but these amazing folks have put an incredible amount of their time and their love and their passion and their experiences forward um, for the good of the WFTDA. And we are incredibly grateful for their perspectives. Hopefully you saw last month, uh, we shared their guiding principles. And so this is a full document that you can find on the WFTDA community, community blog uh, in the latest news section. I really hope that you take the time to read it through fully uh, because these are the basic uh, outline bullet points they are working from a place of a commitment to community and community building. They're working from a place of commitment to inclusion and accessibility. They have a commitment to addressing harm and violence. And they have a commitment to accountability. And those are things that we are really uh, working to translate into the WFTDA leadership conversation. We have had WFTDA staff and board over the past um, year, since the beginning of the year, since the end of last year, working on anti-racism education process. And we are committed to supporting them and uplifting them in their ability to work to uh, benefit all folks in our community. 
So what's exciting is that this first phase of the art project has been very much a storming phase of coming together with a variety of ideas and priorities and trying to figure out where they all fit together. Um, they have put together an outline of task forces that they are looking to create, and some of them have already started working, which I can talk about in a moment. But uh, WFTDA structure and competition is a part of their um, planning, communication and accessibility, officiating and rules, educational programming, and accountability and membership. These were all things that they came to us and said, we feel these are priorities and we absolutely agree with them. So we are going to be uh, meeting over the next few weeks to figure out how to transition all of this great energy into phase two of the art project. So our next step will include uh, determining what is needed for phase two, including new member recruitment, if we need to recruit for new members, and providing some structure and timelines around task force activation, which I think is going to be um, the really exciting part of our work, where we bring together the art project with community members, focus groups, um, individuals to give feedback uh, and inform the process of how all of those task force conversations come together. One final note I wanted to uh, share with everybody is that Oxford College of Emory University has awarded us a summer research grant um, to work with our WFTDA uh, art project officiating task force. Uh, and so the WFTDA is going to be working with a research student, um, Sihithi Gangaram, who is going to be working on um, delving into previous WFTDA tournament data that we have uh, from our events to study racism and racial bias in our competitive pathways. And we know this isn't a, a perfect uh, scenario for how we can study because we don't have roller derby happening right now everywhere. So our thought process was that we would work with the task force to identify a number of games from competitive pathways over the past several years that we do have data for, that we have sports books for, that we have video for, um, and to conduct a study um, that we are able to use as a jumping off point for reevaluating how we officiate and reevaluating conversations um, about certification, um, officiating, and more. Um, we're really grateful to Emory and to Professor Zach Binney, who many of you may remember uh, from our COVID panel discussions last summer, is an epidemiologist who was incredibly supportive of our COVID-19 plan uh, and was able to secure the funds to be able to get this study done this summer. So we feel like this is a great way to kick off the officiating task force. So some key takeaways um, from our presentation today. Uh, we are looking to move the art project into the next phase uh, with the task forces, with the focus groups, with uh, in particular the officiating study. Um, we are putting together updates of the COVID-19 plan that we are looking to launch in early June with the goal of trying to get you back on skates. We are focusing on rebuilding our leagues out of this conversation. We want to emphasize safety while we're doing it. We want to talk about how we can support regional returns as they can happen, recovering from COVID-19. And we want to be able to fundraise to help you. We want to be able to fundraise to um, provide opportunities for you to be able to put money back into your businesses to be able to make our community run again.
A final plug for the WFTDA online annual meeting. If you are a WFTDA member or a WFTDA member, you can join us online in the community and the URL is right here, community.wftda.org. And the homepage will have all of the information that you need to uh, direct yourself to the annual meeting presentations. The presentations will be uploaded by Saturday, May 22nd, that is tomorrow. Um, we have additional presentations and there are still, we wanted to remind our members, WFTDA member votes happening right now. We have a member vote that reps need to complete. We need to be uh, ratifying Deadeye as president. We need to be approving our bylaws changes. We have a lot of exciting uh, policy for you to engage in outside of the conversations that we've talked about today, but we need you to come back to the community to engage with us on this so that we can move forward with these votes. Um, and then we also have another round of WFTDA elections about to start for um, a number of our elected seats. So it's incredibly important. It's a great time for you to get back into the community. There's so much for you to talk about. Um, this is really our, you know, our big ask to our WFTDA members right now. And uh, we are just incredibly humbled by the partners, by the community members, by the COVID medical team. Um, we could not have put together these COVID guidelines without these stellar individuals. Uh, we have additional members who are joining us as we speak. Um, our art project members have been instrumental in helping us um, to see our blind spots, to think about things um, that could be built so much more equitably. And the first phase of the art project process um, has been a good deal of talking and thinking, and it has been incredibly important because that has resulted in some really meaningful task forces and steps that we're about to take forward. Um, so we're incredibly grateful to uh, our WFTDA partners, the national governing bodies uh, that we work with around the world, MRDA and JRDA. Um, and of course, I thanked you at the beginning of our presentation, but I just really want to thank you again. WFTDA members, you did what no other sport would do. You put lives before laces in this pandemic, and I don't know if it's really possible to thank you. Enough. So with that being said, I would like to uh, end our presentation. We did not take questions today, but we are really happy to answer any that you have. Um, we will gladly answer COVID-19 questions at COVID-19 at WFTDA.com. If you have questions specifically for me, you can email me at Erica at uh, WFTDA.com. And if you have questions for our uh, directors, our board of directors, um, I, I'm not sure, but I believe directors at WFTDA.com should work for everybody. Um, so we really look forward to seeing you in the community and we appreciate your time today. And if you weren't able to tune in live, uh, we appreciate you checking this out after the fact, uh, because this is a really important conversation that we're looking to start with everybody. So thank you so much.